Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. Okay. Okay, we'll get, get started. Thank you all for coming. I'm really happy to introduce Seth Hunter. Um, who's visiting us here today. Seth is just finishing up his PhD at the MIT Media Lab. Um, and uh, I think one of the challenges Seth probably has, he has too many interesting projects to share with you in the time frame that we have. Um, so we'll see some of his work, but feel free if you, if you have time scheduled to talk with him. I think he probably has lots of other projects that he's not able to show today. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Seth. I do have a large variety of projects, but I thought, uh, I thought I'd start out by um, talking about integrated defense acquisition technology and logistics lifestyle management. <laughs> uh, April Fools. So, uh, happy April Fools Day, everybody. Um, my, what I thought I'd talk about is just my current work so you could sort of see what I'm working on, uh, which is nice because then you, it sort of gets out of the way and, and then I can talk about how I led up to that. Um, I always hate waiting till the end of a talk to see what someone's working on now. So, um, and then. I thought I'd talk a little bit about my background. Um, it's a little bit different than a traditional researcher, but I think that could be an advantage here. Um, and I have two in-depth uh, projects where I'll talk a little bit more about uh, a full kind of spectrum analysis and the process leading up to those projects. One is the MEM table, um, and the other is something I call vision play, which is about uh, using physical objects to control digital characters with other people at a distance. Um, and at the end, I'd like to just sort of touch on what, what's next for me and some of the areas that I think would be great to grow. Um, so uh, the fundamental problem, as I see it right now, um, in the current research I'm doing, is that we're separated. Um, we're in uh, two different, when we're video conferencing with each other in all these different environments, you still have two windows. You're not really doing things in the same space together. Um, and the other problem is that children lose interest very quickly. A lot of Corey's research and, and, and research from Nokia has shown that, um, especially in the ages of like four to seven, uh, kids get distracted easily by what's in their environment, and they have a hard time you know, knowing where the camera can see them. Um, and maybe you've experienced this yourself. The Connect and the We have really brought families on their feet, using their bodies, doing things together in the same space. And I find this really powerful as a way of um, getting people together and, and getting them also parents involved in media, new media experiences. So this is an artist named John Klang. You may have seen some of his work. Um, and these are just Skype calls projected on the wall, right? I think it points to this idea that we really want to be together. We want to be in the same space. So, so what I've been working on more recently is called Wazam. Um, this is six people, three in one space, three in the other. <laughs> and uh, what is Wazam? Well, Wazam is like Skype plus Connect plus your imagination. Um, you take the Connect camera right now and you plug it into your PC, plug the PC into your TV, and Wazam, you're connected to the other person. Um, so what really makes Wazam magical is that you can do things in the same space together. Um, I'll show you a little bit of footage from the pilot study that I've done. So this is two, it's really rough footage, but two kids in two different spaces. Uh, oh, very nice. You needed a haircut, Paul. Oh my gosh. Let's get in front. This is a dad and a parent, and two, a dad and a kid in two different spaces. So a lot of goofiness, a lot of role playing, uh, a lot of acting things out. You know, this notion of like pretending because uh, it's not really the real self, but at the same time you can do things you wouldn't normally do, like punch the other person. Um, the mother daughter. Dancing is something that can be really, you know, fun to do together. Uh, and I think you've seen this with the Kinect camera, like some of the most more popular games are about imitation, using your body in interesting ways. Um, so, so, you know, the next thing I wanted to highlight is sort of what is my design process and motivation? Where do I come from? Um, for me, uh, interaction design is really about people. And I always think about what it means to have a face-to-face -face interaction with somebody versus a mediated one. So this is a piece that I made at Mediamatic in a four-day hack. And it's called Staring Contest. And I thought I'd highlight it as a way of thinking about this is a staring contest. Um, 
so what we did in this project was to do blink detection. Whoever blinks first loses, and a seven second video gets uploaded to a social media second of their losing moment. Um, and this is like super popular, and also hundreds of people talked to me about how much they enjoyed like having this very unmediated interaction with another person where you're really staring into their eyes. Um, and even though it was just a, a provocation, an art project to me is a provocation, to me it was a provocation about HCI, it's about what it means to interact with each other. Can you have technology facilitating that without um, ruining the, the, the feeling that you have, you know, really making eye contact with somebody else? But this conversation happens within a media ecology. Um, so I see the, the process of interaction design as a systemic one, where um, we're really thinking about information, displays, and people, and that we have a responsibility when we're looking two to five years ahead to think about um, how we're going to interact with each other um, and to identify, question, and, and respond to technology trends uh, that are happening. So these are inspiring people who've talked a lot about how we interact with objects and people. Uh, and I've worked a lot with Sherry Turkle, who um, ask the question, like, does technology serve our human purposes? And this is really what I ask myself all the time, and it's why I'm interested in the social aspects of our engagement with technology, because um, I think to a certain extent, we, we can simulate our relationships with each other, or we can strengthen our relationships with each other. Um, and in this sort of transmedia environment where people are participating in multiple ways uh, with media, I think that um, Empowering them to be producers versus consumers is another part of what motivates me personally as a designer. So thinking about how we can strengthen our social relationships and how we can be more creative with media in a social way if possible. So scaffolding how children learn socially, but also um, how we interact with each other when we're interacting through a screen with each other. Um, so typically the way that I, uh, I work is uh, sort of identify what my values are, um, ask really core questions about why I'm creating something. And then I like to go through a, more of an art-based process, studio process, where I sketch out things, role play them, storyboard those things, outline, develop, test, and revise. Um, and the implementation the tech, of the technology, I think for me, a lot of times it happens um, programming, but really with collaboration with other people. So I think it takes a vibrant community of a technologist to build things that are meaningful to people, not just one person. The, the idea is like 1% of it to me. Um, within such a complex ecosystem of tools and methodologies, it's really how to understand that ecology and how to collaborate with others that's important to me. So that's one of the reasons I'm here, is to um, find peop really strong people to collaborate with. Um, now, looking at my background, you may ask, like, what role do fine arts have in interaction design? What role would fine arts have? Um, at MSR because I do have a background in the fine arts coming into the lab. So I want to share that with you because I think there is a thread that's important and often unrecognized. Um, I started out by uh, making these really, really large projections of one inch square images in a gallery space like the size of the wall. Um, and uh, they're, they're, to me they're just quite beautiful. Um, this is a train texture. These are uh, pictures of cement, different pictures of rust. Uh, and I was really interested in, in the structure of these things, so I started pr making algorithmic programs to try to uh, simulate this um, and exploring the sort of ephemeral nature of those things, the complexity that you could get with uh, uh, a pro writing programs. Um, I started making prints and then printing these things and, and selling them in galleries for about a year and a half. Um, but I did find that as you, you know, learn to generate different algorithmic forms, um, they start becoming less and less interesting because there's no social component. Um, you're really operating within the art economy, which is um, more of a commerce or, uh, I guess, a, a way for people to have wine and cheese. So I started thinking much more about um, visualizing something more social. These plants are um, part of an exploration called Word Garden. And Word Garden is a survey, so it says like mother, father, um, color, sister, brother on the roots. And then all the associations people had are the sprouts. And they're organized by either negative, positive, 
uh, or neutral, which people rated after each association. And the time that they took to answer is the length and the curliness of each of the plants. So looking at this one, you can see the person took a moderate amount of time to answer, and they answered in a variety of ways, mostly positive. This person um, took a lot, little bit shorter, except for the first two, maybe the last one, um, and answered quickly as well. This person was all positive <laughs> and answered very quickly. Um, so I can see, and this person took a really long time, was very thoughtful, and had a diversity of answers. So you can begin to see the character, characteristics in the plants of the people who were filling out the survey. And so using information visualization as a way to kind of make an artwork and then share that with the person who took the survey. So each person would get a print in the mail. Um, and these things were all shown in the gallery as well. Um, thinking about this visualization of the self became more and more interesting to me. So I started making portraits um, about interactivity itself. Um, these portraits are, this was called um, stillness clock motion clock. So stillness clock would be this clock. It would tick when you would go, when you were standing still in front of an interface. And motion clock would move when you're um, not actually paying attention to it. So you'd get something like this. This is sped up. But what was interesting about this was asking the user to think about attention itself, to think about engagement. Uh, and then the interface is measuring that in two different ways. Um, and what we got when we showed this in six different locations around the world, we got all these different portraits of people, uh, slit scan portraits of people interacting with the system. And this brings up this notion of time. So this is a picture that never happened. Um, different times during a party, people came up to the camera, took the picture, and then they were all juxtaposed together. Uh, I call this concept chronographer, and it's something that I've been exploring in the Media Lab as an art form, it's the notion of remixing time in some way. So you're taking moments from the past and mixing them with the present using background subtraction. So this is an exploration to kind of think about this, a provocation uh, like of history trails, um, which eventually became an installation in our lab. So this is like a slow glass kind of thing where looking down on the space, you can see the history of the space over time. Um, using background subtraction in OpenCV. Um, so throughout the day, you could walk by this monitor and glance at it, and you begin to see um, different things that happen in the space. And we also began to explore um, time as a, as a medium, interactive medium, uh, looking back in repeating time. So <clears throat> in this case, uh, you would see yourself at 10 seconds, at 20 seconds, at 40 seconds, repeated in that kind of infinite loop. Uh, and this is an installation that we put in the Media Lab, sort of exploring this notion of seeing not only yourself, but other people who'd been in the space at a, at a time, at the same time. This is also something I was talking to Corey earlier about, this notion of the second self. What happens when you see yourself repeated? How does it change your perception of yourself over time? So a lot of these portraits that I worked on, this is six years ago, um, were really about seeing the self and seeing the self over time in relationship to other people. Uh, and I'm still exploring these ideas in many ways. Um, still watching really was a portrait of yourself that would trickle in over time. So the longer you stayed in front of it, the more distinct your image would be. In a way, this is like, the opposite of interactivity. I'd call it a passively responsive interface. And so again, these are provocations about interactivity. Um, and they eventually led to a project in 2007 that I worked on called the Metadome. Um, Metadome is an immersive space. Uh, I know Andy's done a few things in this area, but it's an inflatable dome um, with a, a spherical projector in it. And the goal of the project for me was um, to use the universe as a, as a metaphor to draw people um, into awareness of each other and themselves during an immersive uh, cinematic experience. So people would go into the dome for about four or five minutes, and they'd sit in these video chairs. The chairs would measure how much they were moving. 
And as a result, the stars would either come out of the sky and join them or sort of stay in the sky, depending on how, much, how, how little or how much they were moving. Um, eventually, the stars would migrate to your head um, in the space and then join everybody else's at the apex of the dome. And the sound would go from being a kind of static, like shh, to being more like something that felt more like harmony or engendered a kind of, um, we, I worked with a sound artist on it, but engendered this feeling of unity with others. So in, in part, this came out of the fact that in Chicago, I couldn't see the stars. 90% um, of the stars are occluded by this kind of pink haze over the sky there. Um, and in part, it was about thinking about how an interface might engender social unity. And finally, the last project, just about my background, is uh, uh, I've done a lot of Im stuff with immersive projection in the Media Lab. So I've built systems that um, create really large uh, projection with four projectors, thinking about how you blend together different spaces. Um, and this is really a platform for other people in the lab to develop something. So we made sketches that work in open frameworks, processing, action script. And what I was interested in is what, social, what new social possibilities exist between people when they're in a space, uh, and what, what, what new ways can people use their bodies to interact with information. What I learned from this, though, is that in something this large, you really read it from multiple spaces. You read it from the fifth floor, the fourth floor, the third floor. Wherever you are in the space, it reads differently. And so you have to think about it in, uh, in multiple levels. Um, it has to be socially scalable, but it also has to be able to be viewed from many different places. And I mean, in a way, it's simple. I'm just tracking people and giving people that information about the contours and the direction they're going. But um, a lot of people did magical stuff with it in the lab, and it's part of the arts festival coming up. So often in my practice in an institution, I try to provoke and think about artistic possibilities, as well as do more HCI-oriented research. So now I'd like to show you two projects that are more uh, on the HCI um, cycle or track. The first one's called the MEM table, and it was my master's thesis at the Media Lab in 2009. Um, so I spent about 10 or 15 minutes talking about that. Uh, what the MEM table was focused on is, again, thinking about the social interaction with each other, but really thinking about how we interact with each other in meetings and in brainstorming. Um, and looking at how we arrange spaces. We use stuff, right? And we use large surfaces together to arrange objects. So I was thinking about this when I was taking these pictures, just really looking at surveying how people use spaces together and thinking about how would an interactive table be in a space like this. One of the critiques that I had of Microsoft Surface, at least the first one, was that you couldn't put your legs underneath, you know? So I've seen a lot of people using it in our space. Um, in fairly awkward ways. Uh, the display wasn't really always integrated with the objects on it. Um, we did use the surface a lot to do prototypes. Um, and I was also inspired by uh, Van der Bush's original idea of this sort of Mimex table, a table that remembers a memory of what happens inside it. Um, Pierre Wellner's work, Rick Moto, Bill Buxton, all, all of them about, were about integrating the physical and digital objects together. Um, and Bjorn Hartman's work here at this lab, I guess it's not in the related work, but um, I corresponded a lot with Bjorn and, and other researchers who, who had done uh, the, the four by six table here. Um, just thinking about how do you interact on large surfaces together, um, but still be able to put your legs underneath have it be an ergonomic experience. So I began, as I began to think about it more and more deeply, we just tried to take a very integrated approach. Uh, at CHI in 2009, there was this discussion about killer apps or what was going to, you know, is multi-touch a dry well? And um, what I, what I, my take on it was that um, the reason why you didn't see a lot of large screens in the workplace is because um, it didn't work well for a number of reasons. And so an integrated approach was to try, and, to try and attack many of the different pain points in terms of using tables together. Uh, and one of those is just being able to work at it daily, put it, putting your legs underneath. So I worked with Steelcase on this design. 
Uh, and the primary part of the design that's interesting is this box in the middle, um, which centers the projectors and the cameras together so that all the sensing can happen and you can still put your legs underneath because uh, there's a border around the table and that border supports the objects. Um, and it's been, it was in our lab for about three years and uh, what it does is it saves the history of what you do at it. And so I'll show you a little bit about that. So it not only did it say the history of what was happening in our lab at a given time, but we also did a lot of user studies. And so I'll show you a little bit how it works. Um, when you touch your face, you get this menu that comes up. And you can fling the menu to, to the side, kind of like a hockey puck, and it sticks to the edges. Um, and there's two things that you can do. Um, you can either take things out of the table from a previous meeting, or you can put things into it. Um, so you have these two icons here. Um, and then there's a heterogeneous set of inputs that you can use. So we try to support as many different work styles as possible. Uh, and so let's say you start a meeting and you wanted to go back to something that happened previously. You'd scan over the landmark events on the timeline from the previous meeting. And then you could grab something from within that widget and pull it into the current meeting. Then it would become part of the current session. The next time you go back to that meeting, you would see that thing. So somebody could come in five minutes early to a meeting and pull out a few things just to remind you of what you were doing the last time you met together. Each of the keyboards was associated with the, with, uh, the person based on these menus. And you could, you could enter things into the system that way. Uh, and then each of these entries would be tagged. So you could tag it manually, or you could tag it asynchronously offline using Google Wave. Um, one interesting thing we used is the Inoto pens to synchronize um, paper real time with a kind of virtual notebook on the system. So that way you could take the paper with you, but you'd also have the digital version saved. There were overhead cameras to capture objects. And we eventually used uh, iFi cameras so that people could sort of creatively take pictures anywhere around the system. Uh, and there were a lot of features built into this. I worked on it for about a year and a half off and on. Um, really trying to think about, I was really trying to make a system that worked well and pretty seamlessly. So we had PC and Mac FTP clients so you could send a screen capture from your computer to the system. Um, and, and multiple desktops and audio recording. And a lot of it was really about, OK, now what do we do if we have a system where we can record all these things. I don't recommend virtual keyboards. That was just an experiment. <laughs> um, and also, if I'm developing on this thing daily, uh, you know, what utility could it really serve in my life? Um, so a typical scenario would be that we would meet together after having a meeting uh, with physical prototypes. And then we'd see something about our last meeting there. Um, so I, I'd bring a prototype to the table, maybe sketch a little bit about it. Um, we found that people did not use the audio very much. They would rather have the audio in sync with another form of input. So if you touched like the sketch, you could hear what somebody said during that time, or you touched some other input. Um, so, so one of the things we did was analyze all these different forms of feedback, um, or forms of entry into the system. So it's just giving you a sense of maybe what a meeting would look like as it built over time. Um, so the first two components is to save a memory is an interest, a really way to add utility, to make it ergonomic. And the third thing was to integrate it with a, uh, an offline uh, review process where people could tag so then you could search either at the table or offline using Google Wave. So we integrated this with Google Wave. Um, I worked with some great undergraduates at MIT to do that. And, um, I think this, this allows people, people tend to make decisions not during meetings, but asynchronously at, in their desk or when they're reflecting. So this integration was really about um, engendering that reflection process for people. Um, so there were a lot of different uh, types of input and output um, and integration in this project. Um, but what did we learn from it? So we did a study where we compared people using the table just with objects, but the table is completely off. So they're in the same environment, but without any of the capabilities of the table. Um, and then we did uh, studies with people using the table. Uh, three of the groups used the table, and three of the groups did not in the study. 
So it's a paper-based versus uh, a non-paper-based groups. So you can see the study here. Um, what it would look, what one of the groups looked like. And one of the things I noticed is that the table actually kind of creates this formal space um, that you really have to navigate a lot because it's the the system's on, um, but it also like it puts you in the table itself is is very formal in some sense. Um, so it it really um, made people remember more just because when they were using the system. I think because of uh, having the menus in their seats and um, and watching what was entered into the system. Um, what we found was that people did not remember more accurately, but they remembered in greater detail and with more rich in it, richness when they had the digital component as well as the physical. So I'll just give you a sense of, over time, how these different meetings would occur. And subsequently, I've started thinking about what, what could really work in a workplace and why haven't we seen these things. And I've, I have a few ideas about how people use spaces. I, I think that integrating two vertical displays on each corner would allow you to present when you want to present. And then the table itself could be a sharing space where you deposit things into the memory of the system, but you can also share assets with each other across the table. One of the problems for, for doing research in this space is that um, in order to, to set up the system, there's so much work. <laughs> You know, in terms of keeping track of the memory and m making sure that um, people are enrolled in the system, uh, you know, you can get way deep into just the temporal as aspects of how people meet together. And you know, it was it was a new space for me when I was doing this. Um, but we published a paper at Kai, and uh, it was really focused on thinking about an integrated approach. Um, and how did people really you know, use this within our lab? Um, well, I, th I think they used it in, in playful ways, and that's what I really liked to see. Um, it became a kind of place for people to leave messages for each other. Um, it became a space for people to, to gather when you know, it was one of the few meeting tables that was always open and on because it was a demo. Um, so. If, this is kind of how I would conceive of, of like a much better version of this. Add remote capability and add two displays on either corner in some way. So you can present, but you can also incorporate remote groups in some interesting way. So looking at the future of the space, I think something that might really work will incorporate those aspects. OK, so, um, so this is the second project. Um, And it's really a series of projects that have led up to the current research that I'm doing. Uh, has anyone seen Siftables or know about Siftables? I guess so. <laughs> so I worked with David Merrill in an office for two years. And um, what I was interested in with Siftables is making applications for children, because they have this intuitive, um, kids know how to use blocks, but they don't have necessarily, uh, I, they haven't used a mouse and a keyboard as much. So. Um, so I began working on an application that connects the Siftables to a larger screen called um, Telestory, like T-E-L-E -E story. And the idea was that if you held up the sun, it would become daytime. If you held up the moon, it would become nighttime. You change the environmental parameters. Um, if you showed the screen the, the uh, tractor, then the tractor would come in. What I noticed, and you may notice this about this particular child, um, was that they would show the screen something as if the screen could see it. You know, this is really a, a nice takeaway for me, um, just on a from an intuitive design standpoint. Um, this notion that uh, we want objects to communicate with each other, and so we kind of signal to those objects. Or at least kids think that the TV can see it. So we're working on TVs that can see us, <laughs> and um, and so I started outlining what I call vision play framework. And this is partly because I was working for Hasbro at the time during the summers, and Hasbro was sponsoring my research. And that might put it into perspective why I'm so interested in objects and puppetry and expression. But um, what can you do? What are the playful things you can do with computer vision? And how, why is that interesting? Um, so puppetry is one. Just real-time animation is another way of talking about it. <laughs> um, 
remote playing, two people playing with objects at a distance and then using that to create content, and mixed reality scenarios where you see yourself in the story. So I'll, show you, I'll try and show you examples of each of those. Um, but what inspires me are components of creativity. So transformation, social play, interactivity, gaining ownership through creating something, um, storytelling and fantasy. When we interact together and we engage in some way uh, that transforms us or, or engages us with each other or brings up new, gives us ownership of the content, I think then it becomes magical in some ways. Um, and so imagine, you know, you make your own drawing, or a kid makes their own drawing, and then they hold it up to the screen, and that's what appears on the screen. Um, then they make an object, or they have their favorite toy, and they hold that up, and it appears, sorry. And then they call a friend, um, and then that friend holds their object up, and that appears on the screen. So this is kind of my dream, is that people will start making animations at a distance with each other in many different ways. Uh, and I've been exploring how you would go about doing that. So the first way I explored it was pre-connect. Um, this is like a floating green screen concept, <laughs> I guess. So it's a glove with a character in it. Um, and then as you move the character up, it gets smaller towards the horizon line. And as you move it down, it gets more in the foreground. So there's this loose 2.5D mapping to the world. Um, the cool thing about it, you know, real-time segmentation, is that you can put any object in there. You can put an owl or your hand, or um, and puppets are especially expressive uh, in terms of uh, objects. So, um, so Hasbro was interested in My Little Pony uh, assets from their TV show running up and playing with My Little Pony when you hold up My Little Pony. And I think that's very interesting as well. Um, that's probably where they would take it. Um, but they were also interested in action figures. So I started working with a puppeteer, and um, what makes puppetry interesting to me is really the form of the character is very similar to what you're controlling on the screen. So um, with a PlayStation, when you press a key and that makes the character jump, <laughs> it's not the same as making the character jump with your hands. So I was interested in this scenario where I would be holding a puppet and you would be holding a puppet, I'd be controlling the samurai, you're controlling the dragon, and we're playing together in, in a, at a distance. Um, and how could you accomplish this? Uh, I tried a number of different scenarios. I tried using markers. I mean, some of you have worked with Roy, I guess, who is here. Um, using shape description uh, and ended up uh, creating a kinetic model in, a, in Box 2D, a, a physics program that could loosely correlate to the physical model on the top left there. Um, this is when it was still, I was still debugging it, but eventually it started to look more like this. <laughs> Where you could just hold a character up and then 30 frames a second, the, the sort of costume version of the character on the screen would react. The difference here between this and the previous approach with the uh, floating green screen is that um, it can interact with objects in the scene and it can also have behaviors of its own. So there's a much looser correlation between what you're doing and what you see in the, in the digital character. The limitation is that you can't hold up multiple objects, right? Unless the system somehow figures out what it is you're holding or what the properties of that, uh, that action figure are. This is sort of how I would costume it, using Photoshop mostly, with alpha PNGs. So we did some pilot studies with kids, and what we found is that um, children have difficulty with puppets that have more than three sticks. Two sticks is sort of more, much more ideal, and, um, they're, but they're extremely interested in controlling things on the screen. Um, and also just discovering what the affordances of those things are, so figuring out that, that relationship between the object and the thing on the screen. And the more closely correlated it is, the more expressive it is, the more interesting the um, engagement between the characters. But they have trouble seeing where the camera is, so one of the things I've done is to build a stage that kind of tells you where the camera is and try to um, even put glass there so that you don't go too far forward where the camera can't see you anymore. So once you get over the novelty of something like this, what can you do with it? Um, 
it's a difficult space to, to parse. Uh, I've also tried for Hasbro, again, uh, putting your face into the story using hard classifiers. So you can kind of control your own doppelganger, I guess. <laughs> um, and, and this is really tricky because when you're trying to do faces and move the character around at the same time, it's, your mind gets split into two different directions. So um, my takeaway from this is that it might be better to record these things in two different tracks. Um, or have somebody else control your puppet while you do the faces uh, at a distance. It's a future area I'd like to explore. Uh, I'm going to skip over some of this stuff, but I've done a lot of uh, green screen theaters at Harvard um, in a puppetry course, thinking about um, how can we be expressive real time? How can we make real time animations with different objects in more flexible ways? Learning things from the film industry in a way about um, doing stuff quickly. <laughs> so um, I still remember what it's like to be a 13 year old boy. I don't know how many of you do, <laughs> uh, but I try to utilize that as a, as a, I push that with my research. So um, <laughs> yeah. So I've done performances as uh, Steve Mobs <laughs> the, from the Muppets. Um, and in those performances, the objects, the toys are advocating to be a part of the digital experience again because um, they've been left out. <laughs> um, so, so you'd set up a little stage of toys, and then uh, they're all protesting, and, and he's speaking. So I was really doing the Occupy movement, thinking about how toys might become part of our digital experience. Um, and eventually, this led to what I'm doing now because I was trying to link real-time uh, segment, segmented puppets together, but I ended up uh, enabling a more composite environment for people. And Patty's very good, my advisor, at helping me make things more generalizable to our sponsors. <laughs> Not everybody's interested in real-time animation or uh, expression. And so um, I've ended up turning this into a much more general platform and working on it for about nine months now. Um, and it's been, I think, to date, um, one of the more successful projects. Um, just to look at, at some of the related work that inspires um, these kinds of telepresence systems. Many of you know Myron Kruger, I guess, um, sort of legendary in some, some circles. In 1980, uh, 1975, he was working on systems like this. And his original vision was this notion of an artificial reality where we would see these versions of each other in, in virtual space interacting and overlapping and transforming in magical ways. Um, I found a lot of inspiration from this work that explored four different ways that um, children could interact together um, and all the different affordances that come from, from those different modalities. And to me, it speaks to this idea of there's a really rich uh, space of mixed reality experiences that can connect children and parents and children and children to each other. Um, so this is a a really informative work for me, and also Nokia's work on storytelling at a distance. Um, and Sean's a really good friend of mine. Uh, when he started collaborating with Nokia, um, I think they're doing a startup based around this concept now, which is uh, really interesting to see, and I, I'd love to follow that work. But the concept is to see yourself and the other person in a story uh, during bedtime experience, experiences with children. And th you know, there have been. Um, compositing systems prior to what I'm doing. I think what, what makes you, I'll talk a little bit about, about what's new about what I'm doing compared to these previous compositing systems. Um, so there's one, been one from our lab, um, Stefan Agamelos from 1997. And then there's been a lot of green screening based systems for people to do things together in shared environments. Um, I think this one's called Hypermirror. Uh, BT has worked a lot in this space too. Um, they have an initiative, an $18 million European initiative on, uh, to, you know, called VConnect, which is about engendering this feeling of being together in spaces. And um, I invited BT to the workshop that's happening at CHI, so they'll be there and we'll be able to engage more with them on this. Um, but I'm really interested in what researchers out there are, are thinking about shared experiences uh, in composite video environments. And, uh, Roy Ascott and Paul Sermon have also been working for 20 years in telematic art experiences <laughs> that happen in these sort of crazy blue screen sets where you can 
um, you can think about how a narrative would take place through real-time acting with others at a distance. So what we've built so far, um, this is in one space and that's in the other, is uh, you know, a client that, that transfers the image real-time in the depth image and then allows them to composite in different ways. So I can either go to your space or you can go to my space. Um, or we can create a fantastic background. And one of the things I did is to overlap the images to, you know, in OpenCV so that you can become, I can make my body yours or you can make your body mine. And you can kind of build these sets. So the sets are, are layered PNG files um, that are organized in the Z space. And you can place them where you want to. Um, and what I'm working on right now is a set builder uh, for parents and children so they can design their own sets together and then go in and then use them together. Um, and so we're doing a study where uh, over a three week period we start by int just introducing them to the system so they can get over the novelty of it so they can try it out together. And once they get used to it, um, we will introduce them to the scene maker. Um, and so the parent will, will, the ch will teach the children how to make the scenes first. A fairly simple layout program. And then the p children will teach the parents and they'll work together to make environments. And we want to study how they use those environments over time. So in subsequently two or three more sessions, do those environments take on more significance? Um, the system already has a lot of interesting things like you can move characters, people around as you can transform their size. A lot of things inspired by Myron Kruger. Um, and th there's uh, the technical implementation I'll skip over, but we're working on the foreground protocol, the compositing techniques, the 2.5D renderer. Um, you know, I've been writing all this, all this code mostly in C++, OpenCV, um, to try and build the system because I really imagine that people, you know, especially parents and children, I would love to see them interacting like this in their homes. Um, right now it's only working in the laboratory. So puppetry comes back into this as a way of getting, of experimenting with how kids tell stories um, at a distance. So we make puppets. I do these workshops at Hartford, in Hartford with kids, where we make puppets uh, and then we use them with the system as well. And it's actually the most effective way of using puppets with the system is just to set uh, the near threshold at a certain level. So there's like an invisible screen. You place it in and out of the screen and you can, uh, you know where the character is. Uh, it's very intuitive. You can learn it in like a few seconds. Um, we tried tracking the left and the right hand. That was sort of um, too much, I think, in terms of you have to calibrate first and then um, sometimes it would lose the hand and then the puppet would disappear. So that seems to be the most reliable way of exploring uh, acting out different historical narratives and things like that. Um, so just a little bit about what my user study coming up next week is, and then um, so I'd like to study what a couple things. One, traditional versus composited environments. So um, given a choice between a traditional face-to-face -face sort of thing and this merged environment, which one would parents and children choose? Um, what types of activities do you do in this environment? Um, you know, what kinds of free play? Um, how does the engagement vary compared to um, just a regular video conferencing session? And what's the best means of customization of the environment? Is it the offline uh, scene creator, or, or is it better to sort of stamp things in real time um, from your environment? So I'm going to try to add these features. Um, and, and what type of environment is, is best for the parents and children? Um, you know, is it the fantastic background? Is it me joining your space and you, you joining mine? Um, or is it a custom space that you've made yourself? Uh, the social dynamics are something that I'm really interested in. Um, so we have some metrics to rate attention and engagement. And then ownership as well. Uh, it, does customization give you a feeling of wanting to go back to the space if you've helped create it with the, with the other parent? Um, especially over multiple sessions. And then um, within WASAM, a lot of the things I talked about earlier, transformation, um, the magical things that, that enable you to fantasize and storytell and improvise with each other. 
Um, how effective are those in, in terms of, in, in, you know, when you're measuring engagement and getting parents and children to play together? Um, so uh, definitely adding custom content is something that I'm working on, um, using physical objects sort of like IO brush in our, our lab, where you hold the objects up to the screen and they, get, they appear. Or you can place them behind things by moving them through the depth space. And then also thinking about um, how to map different gestures to things like, I'm flying, or make me smaller, or make me bigger. Like, these are things that, are, that we're working on now with some machine learning. Um, and I probably won't get to this in the thesis, but I would love to have it so that you could sort of see different tracks that you've recorded with the other person and decide whether to keep those tracks or not using gestures, um, simple drag and drop sort of thing. Okay, so last two or three minutes, I just want to touch on what would I want to do next, or what are the broad areas that I'm interested in? Um, the first one is creative telepresence systems. So how can broad, you know, variety of audiences really have shared experiences at a distance? That's really what drew me to come here, because I, 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 I like what Corey's doing in her group, and I'd love to um, work in some capacity collaborating on that. So I've been working with some improv artists to make some sketches of the different types of activities that people would do. So acting things out um, within our system um, to kind of create a remote play together um, is one thing you can do. Um, giving a guitar lesson. It's a shared experience that you can't do in Skype, but you can do in our environment. Um, Co-broadcasting together is something I think could be quite compelling. Um, where two people are, you know, sort of relating to media and then rebroadcasting that out to me to to YouTube, and even like asking your roommate if they want to come live with you, and maybe they don't, maybe they do, <laughs> but you can sort of get a sense of their place. So um, these kinds of even negotiations seem fairly interesting. Um, I'm also interested in new depth sensors that are coming out that might enable real-time animation. Um, and so I've been playing a lot with the leap sensor and trying to map these popsicle sticks and felt pieces to different birds, animals, mapping out how different animals move and then thinking about how we can control those animals in 3D space. Not just so you trigger different pre-rendered animations, but so you actually could um, tie into the skeleton of the animal and um, you know, have in a physics world, like the previous explorations, but more in 3D space. Um, it's a difficult area because the physics worlds and 3D, 3D creatures uh, need to have some behaviors, but you also want to... So this is, I think, a really fascinating area and one in which um, sensors will enable new forms of creative expression. Um, Intel has a new camera at the time of flight camera. Has anybody seen this from the Perceptual Computing Group? Yeah, so I was just at Intel last week and um, it's amazing. It's a really, really high definition, beautiful camera. Um, and they're trying to think about different uses for it. Um, and so I've been uh, uh, signed up for the SDK of this, and I'm really interested in using, uh, doing more stuff close to the screen, especially at a distance. If, if we have this thing built into the lid, that's what they're planning to do, is have it built into the lid and release it in the next year or two. Um, so you'll start to see laptops that have this depth capability um, based on stereoscopic time of flight cameras. Uh, and the third thing is augmented play experiences in general. So you've seen a lot of my work, and maybe you get, you get a sense of what I mean by that. Um, we have a Tumblr, arplay.tumblr.com. Uh, if anybody wants to follow it, I'd love to. It's where I keep all of my cool videos um, if, you're always, if you're always looking for new research or cool stuff. Um, please follow it, and we can discuss new videos together. Uh, and then you can, of course, find my work at Perspectum.com. Um, so thanks so much for your time, and I appreciate you coming. Questions? AJ? At the end, it seemed like you were mostly talking about parents and children. Is that the yeah. focus, or is children and children, or how do you think about those groups differently? Well, I started thinking more about parents and children because I saw the imaginative play and the shared experience as a way to kind of bridge the differences between how parents and children see the world and how they play. 
So if you imagine children more like, you know, Alison Gopnik's um, idea that children are like lanterns and they, they take an input from everywhere and parents are more like very focused on one thing or another. Um, the environment that I'm in, I think it creates a, an imaginary context where both people are willing to act out something they normally wouldn't. So I saw it as being most beneficiary to, to that age group. The children and children, um, when I interviewed the children during the pilot study, they said that they'd want to play it with their friends for sure. Um, their best friend usually they would want to play it with when they weren't in the same space together. Um, but Patty's also interested in, the, I guess, how it'll be, uh, how our sponsors will respond to the project. And so I think it has a lot of appeal for us to, to talk about if you're on a business trip, how you might be able to connect, um, you know, if from divorced families. Um, it just seems like the area that where there's the most need. And so that's why I've been um, focused on that. Yeah. So one, one thing I like about your the work you've done with Connect and the Presence and so forth is that you're, it feels like you're not really gunning for um, photorealism yeah. all the time. And I think that, uh, well, I was wondering if you could speculate on sort of where you think that's going to go. Do you think that, that there's going to be a place for this sort of non photorealistic thing? What's it going to look like? What's the new aesthetic of, of depth camera imagery? It's interesting because I visited Cisco and Polycom and I'm like, hey, would you guys use this kind of a system within your business model? And they're like, nope, we only do business to business, like, you know, just critical decision making, get as realistic as you can to face to face. Um, and then, you know, thinking about you guys who are doing more consumer to consumer, I feel like there, uh, if you're with somebody that you're more intimate with and you, you feel comfortable imagining, um, as soon as you cross that threshold between it needs to be real and it can be pretend, then all of a sudden it opens up a whole new space. And that's the space that I'm interested in, is like when you're pretending together, what kinds of things will you create? You know, what kind of, if you're, because every, I feel like, and I mentioned this earlier, I feel like every time we engage in some sort of mediated interaction together, there is a bit of performance happening. You know, you kind of arrange yourself so you're in front of the camera. Um, you know, if you're, if you're doing a connect game, there, it's a bit of a performance in response to stimuli and feedback. So I'm sort of interested in crossing that line from gaming more towards building our own worlds together. So where I see it going is more a community of people who make these sets together and they share them online. And they start to, to be building their own worlds like Minecraft, where um, you know if you look at the gaming world, like World of Warcraft and Minecraft, all these people are building their own worlds and they're so into it. I can imagine people doing that, having, if there's a lower threshold to parents and children and people who would normally Skype, having a shared activity, they could start building their own worlds and sharing them with each other and you'd start to see like, kids more creatively engaged when they're at a distance. So does that sort of hint at where you're going or do you mean more abstractly like? I guess it sounds like you're, you're banking on it sort of being an emergent property of being, you know, giving these tools to other people and sort of see what happens. Yeah, so that's what I'm really interested in is like, if I give this to parents and children, what kinds of stuff will they make? Um, it, you know, will they really get into it or, or would they prefer to have this kind of face-to-face -face engagement? I would think that they would switch between it, you know, depending on the context of what they're doing. If they want to, uh, you know, go to, into a virtual space where they can see all the pictures that they've shared with each other over the last year or two, that would be, I think, a really interesting immersive space because you could sort of pin them on the, um, your virtual space and um, you know if you're look if you're talking about more abstract data sets like a net's work um, uh, you know in the, the space that many of us work in is a simulated space so how do you discuss that space with others at a distance um, if you sort of enter that space together then you can point to different things and manipulate different things in the space so I guess what I'm seeing is that we are we are there's this merger between the real and the virtual, and that merger is happening in many different ways. Information is coming into the world in the more augmented reality space, um, but in the augmented virtuality space, we can also bring our world into the virtual. So it's a, a continual conversation where um, I think there's these subdomains that are going to be really interesting to explore, one of them being the more imaginary possibilities. Um, but I think a lot of it will depend on you know the social the social relationships of the group that you're engaging in 
So like, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to use Wazam with you guys necessarily. It might be fun as a demo, but um, you know, definitely with my cousins and and with my family. So it, it really, for me, it's about situating it within um, the social spectrum in some. Yeah. I came in late, so I apologize if you already answered this good talk, but um, you mentioned a little bit about about the metrics that uh, that you were using, and of course, I'm sure interviews and lots of stories and anecdotes and things like that. How, do you have any way, like, how do you think about measuring things like, um, or do you think about measuring things like the engagement with each other, the engagement um, when you add in, when you have the picture of the tree branch holding up, when you make yeah. real objects, or when you add in virtual objects, or mm -hmm. is there a, is there a metric for like that uh, um, uh, using your imagination to suspend disbelief? Like how I don't know how do you how do you gauge yeah. those things? And, and well, I mean the way we're planning on measuring it is to have two monitors, one in each room, and those monitors have like a the standard one to seven scale, but we have I guess seven things that we're looking at. So one is like how much are they coordinating with each other? How much pretending is there? How much role playing is there? Um, how, when do they add things from the digital world, and when do they add them from the physical world? Um, in a way, that's one way of assessing the features, but also, um, you know, so, this, so we also are going to interview people, but after the the three studies, not during it, during them. We, so it's really observing what they're doing and trying to observe it in a in a fairly structured way. Um, and I've used papers from, uh, actually from Lana Yarish to, to think about what engagement is. Um, and so, yeah, I really turned to, to actually your group and Nokia's group to understand how to assess these metrics. And I, and I usually try to also email somebody outside of myself who's had more experience. Um, Lana and I and Eric wrote the, a, a survey of the values and um, motivation and values that people have for the Interaction Design for Children conference. So um, last year we presented that paper, and it's, it surveys, using grounded research, all the papers from, from the nine years to try and understand what people's motivations are and, and how they do assessment, what theory informs their research. Um, so I've tried to think more deeply about this. Um, and, I, and also Mitch Resnick is, is one of the people who is advising the thesis, so he's been helping me come up with some of these metrics as well. I know that when I present, it's like very visual, and it's, I think that's partly because of my art background, but also that for me, I want to make the presentation like engaging for people so they don't fall asleep. <laughs> um, but there, I also um, it, you know, appreciate the depth that an HCI approach has to really you know, helping you grow as, a, as, a, um, as an interface designer, which is how I think of myself. You know. Mm -hmm. um, you said your stuff is very visual. Have you thought at all or played with other modalities to in increase this yeah. sense of presence, whether it's tactile, auditory? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think sound is one that I've used a lot. I didn't show any of the work, but on my website there's a, a lot of work about what I call sound forms. There are different objects that would have different sound properties, and depending on how you lay them out in relationship to each other, you generate different compositions. And this is using Microsoft Surface because you could get really nice data <laughs> about the shape of objects from Surface. Um, and so that was used in more art therapy type of sessions for children um, who, who are interested in learning musical concepts. But uh, I am interested in sound, and, and I love collaborating with sound artists or, or sound researchers. Um, I haven't done anything. Um, with you know localized sound or anything in in telepresence systems, but I've spoken a lot with Cisco and Polycom and visited them and and sort of learned more about how they approach that to create sort of a spatial sense of where people are, who's talking when. Um, so I do follow the research in that area, um, and I'm very interested in. And in it. it's just a difficult space to work in. <laughs> Yeah. 
would there be the application of projecting out, out into a larger space where you have more uh, physical collaboration between two people in, the, in different areas of the world? Yeah. And it, have you uh, done any experimentation with multiple people in such a large experience and more immersive in like a theater setting hmm. um, in any sense? There's, I think there are some people who have experimented with this. I'm not sure if, without a distance, but there's been a lot of people doing, like using the contours to generate graphics or to sort of create an immersive theater experience where there is digital content that's mixed with real time performance. And th those are really inspiring to me. But one of the, I think, interesting things about awareness interfaces is if, like, you know, uh, I guess you guys have a new Microsoft Research in New York. Like, if you could connect these two spaces together in a public installation that was in the same, like, in a central place in both buildings, um, I think it'd be interesting to see this sort of time based, you know, to experiment with how you could make that work. Um, because people wouldn't always be standing at the same time in front of each other, but maybe you could build something that would asynchronously mix them together. Um, so, so I, th I really th I think it is a very interesting space. Um, I just am not working in that space currently, <laughs> but um, taking it to a larger scale. Probably one of the things you're thinking is like, oh, there's such a broad spectrum of projects. You know, I think that's partly the fact that um, at the Media Lab we have a lot of liberty to experiment. And um, for me, coming from an arts background, it was a place for me to gain technical competency, but also try things that I hadn't tried before. Um, so I used it as a test bed for a lot of the mixed reality concepts that I was interested in. Okay. Well, if any of you um, would like to chat further with Seth, just reach out to me. It's K-O-R-I. It's my alias. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you so much. I appreciate it.